afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful Sabbath. My message today is going to be a little bit difficult, but Mr. Turgeon's available for after service consultations. <laughs> um, once in a while, I would give a take like a break during my message, and I would tell like some kind of a funny or something like that. And I was looking at this message and thinking there's really not a good place, so I'll give you my funny right now. It wasn't about Mr. Turgeon, but. Um, and it's simply this, life is short, smile while you still have teeth. So while you still have teeth, make sure you smile. Well, brethren, and I forgot my book, if you could hand me that book. I usually don't bring a book up here, so pardon me. Yeah, I'm sorry about this, but I had this book called Unexplained Mysteries of World War II by William Brenner that my father gave to me. And there's a, there's a lot of interesting stories in here. And I wanted to begin today with excerpts from one of the stories. It says, on January 13, 1943, President Franklin Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill and their top aides convened at the stately old Hotel Anfa in Casablanca. After months of bitter fighting, German and Italian forces had virtually been swept from North Africa. Now the joint delegations would answer the key strategic question, where would the next Anglo-American blow fall? What would they do next? Where would the next attack be against Fortress Europe? It said, hardly had the participants settled in their chairs that a heated debate erupted. And so there was a lot of contention at this conference. And as the conference droned on, the American delegation found itself on the losing end of the verbal duel. And after four, after four strenuous days, they capitulated and they agreed that they would invade France. But before departing for home, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill agreed to meet with the press of the free world. There, Roosevelt, in an off-the-cuff manner, let loose a thunderclap that would anguish and dismay other Allied leaders and furnish a gleeful Hitler with a propaganda blockbuster. With scores of journalists avidly taking notes, the American president casually observed, quote, Prime Minister Churchill and I have determined that we will accept nothing less than unconditional surrender of Germany, Italy, and Japan, unquote. Seated next to the president and drawing on a large black cigar, Winston Churchill was stunned this was the first time that the Prime Minister had heard the phrase unconditional surrender used with regard to the current war. And Churchill was deeply alarmed with the Third Reich and its Wehrmacht, or the German military, still a powerful force to be reckoned with. He felt that the posture to be assumed by Allied leadership should be one of defiance. He was convinced that it was a blunder of the first magnitude to be dictating harsh terms to enemy nations at a time when victory or defeat still hung in the balance. But the damage was done. Churchill could not, in the face of the free world's press, take issue with his war partner. He had assured reporters that he concurred with the unconditional surrender ultimatum that he had only moments before heard for the first time. Within minutes, the news was flashed around the globe. Later, a high official of the British government told Churchill, unless those terms are softened, the German army will fight with the ferocity of cornered rats. Already on public record, Churchill merely shrugged. And General Patton also commented, and I won't read what he said because there's profanity with it, but <laughs> basically what he was saying was that you've given the Germans a great imperative now to fight to the very end. And General Dwight Eisenhower, the Allied Supreme Commander, was flabbergasted. And he was confiding to an, an aide, if you're given the chance of mounting the scaffold or charging 30 bayonets, you may as well charge the bayonets. So he was flabbergasted that the president would say this. And in Berlin, top Nazis rejoiced. The eloquent Dr. Paul Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's cunning minister of propaganda, trumpeted to a gathering of party leaders in Berlin. Quote, since the enemies of Germany are determined to enslave our nation, the war has become an urgent struggle for national preservation in which no sacrifice is too great. And cheers echoed from the rafters. 
and German Junkers bombers over England and had measure Smith fighters above the fatherland and U-boats beneath the cold murky waters of the North Atlantic and snow-covered foxholes in the frozen tundra of Russia at dispersed outposts along the underbelly of Europe, those in the German military inwardly reaffirmed their vows to fight to the end with courage, tenacity, and growing feelings of desperation. So we see here that President Roosevelt made a blunder, and there's still some contention or wonder about whether he did this intentionally or whether it was just a slip of his tongue, but he actually encouraged the German military because of what he said. And did it prolong the war? No one knows, but it certainly helped the Germans to, to help with their morale. So I thought this would be a good introduction today to my subject. Today we're going to look at the power of the tongue, and we will examine seven keys that we can use to tame it with God's help. And all of us struggle with controlling our tongue to one degree or another, and myself included, definitely myself included. We all struggle with it. It's so easy to speak and to say things that can cause a great fire, so to speak, sort of like what President Roosevelt did. We can say something and it can cause great amount of problems. But let's notice what James has to say about this in James chapter 3, and we'll read verses 5 through 8. This is very familiar scripture to us, but we need to, to look at this every now and then and be reminded. James chapter 3. Beginning in verse 5. Even so, James writes, even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell or Gehenna. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. You know, the tongue is a little member of our body, but yet it welds great power. Great power. And that power includes using it for sinful purposes. And no man, as James says, in and of himself can fully tame his tongue. In addition to the inherent witness to, or the, the inherent weakness that all of us have to control our tongue, there is a powerful influence that is constantly promoting the use of the tongue for wrong purposes. Notice John chapter 8, verse 44. These are very powerful words of Jesus Christ here in John 8, verse 44. And he's addressing the Pharisees. And he says to them, to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. What a stinging rebuke. And the, the desires of your father, you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. You know, Satan is a murderer. He wishes to murder every single human being if he could. And when he speaks, he speaks from his own resources or what is in his heart. And what does he speak? He speaks lies. He is, in fact, as Jesus Christ says, the father of lies. And Satan uses his tongue for evil purposes. We won't turn there, but in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, the apostle John was inspired to write that the whole world lies under the sway or influence of the wicked one. And certainly one of those evil influences is lying. The use of the tongue for sinful purposes. And we increasingly see the prevalence of lying as we progress in this end time, brethren, where lawlessness is becoming greater and greater in our society and the world. 
we see lying is becoming more and more prevalent, and it's all around us, including in our media, and of course in our politicians and others. Well, King Solomon was given an extraordinary gift from God, the gift of wisdom. What a fantastic gift that was. Let's look at some of Solomon's writings recorded in God's word concerning the wrong use of the tongue, and he wrote a lot about it. Let me just read a few of them to you to save time. But in Proverbs, you can write the scripture down if you wish, but in Proverbs 11, verse 9, Solomon writes that the hypocrite with his mouth destroys his neighbor. What you say can injure and hurt people. In Proverbs 12, verse 18, he says, The tongue can be like a piercing sword. It can be so damaging. In Proverbs 17, verse 9, he said that who, he who repeats a matter separates friends. What you say from your mouth can cause consequences and it can destroy friendships and also your friendship with someone else. There are consequences. In Proverbs 25, 23, he talks about a backbiting tongue and how that brings anger and it stirs up anger and strife. But I think he, he says something very profound in Proverbs 18, verse 21, if you'll turn there with me to Proverbs 18, 21. And if you have a bookmark, if you want to keep it in Proverbs, that would be very helpful because we'll be in Proverbs a little bit today. But Proverbs 18, verse 21 Solomon was inspired to write with the wisdom that he had from God. He says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. There is great power in the tongue, and we will eat the fruit of how we use it. Because the wrong use of the tongue brings anger and strife, and destruction of relationships. It promotes sin and deceit and can wrongfully destroy reputations. It is like a piercing sword, as Solomon says. That is why God, through his word, calls out the power of the tongue and then strongly condemns its wrong use. But while the tongue can be a sword, it is a two-edged sword. Now let's look at the right use of the tongue also in the writings of Solomon in the Word of God. Notice Proverbs 10, verse 11, which isn't too far from where we just were. Proverbs 10, verse 11. Solomon writes, The mouth of the righteous is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. So the mouth of the righteous is a well of life, or it promotes growth and good outcomes. But violence covers the mouth of the wicked, because violence is provoked. So we see the two-edged sword, that is, the power of the tongue. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4, which isn't very far away either, Solomon writes, A wholesome or a righteous tongue is a tree of life but perverseness, and it breaks the spirit. So we see the two-edged sword, but we see the good side, that the tongue can be like a tree of life, of recovery and growth. It can also bring about healing, like a tree and a well, as we saw. Here in Proverbs, in verse 23 of chapter 15, he writes, a man, by the jo a man has joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. You know, joy can truly come from our lips when we are wise, and the right word spoken at just the right time can be so good. I think we've all received this joy at some point in our lives. When someone said, at just the right time, something to us that brought us 
joy or encouragement. We need to be dispensing that ourselves. Are we a source of joy by what we say? And we'll talk about more about this later in the message. And I think Solomon sums up the right use of the tongue in Proverbs 16, verse 24, which is very close to where we just were. He writes that, <clears throat> pardon me, that pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. The right use of the tongue can be so sweet and good, just like the wrong use can be so bad. It's a dual nature. It's a two-edged sword. So we see the dual nature of the tongue and why Solomon says the following in Proverbs 21, verse 23, which also isn't too far away, just a few pages away, Proverbs 21, 23. He said, whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. So you can keep your soul or your life from troubles when you guard your tongue. So we've seen so far how the tongue can be a source of great joy and peace and true knowledge and good outcomes and healing and yet can promote anger on the other side, wrath, destruction, discouragement, and sin. So we see why God clearly tells us to do something very important in James 1, verse 26. If you'll turn there, if you have a marker, keep it in Proverbs. And then let's go over to James chapter 1, verse 26. <clears throat> Pardon me. James chapter 1, verse 26. James writes, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So we see that we must strive to bridle our tongue. It is vitally important that we do. But how can this be done? In James 3.8 that we just read at the beginning of the message, it says that no man can tame his tongue. So is there hope for taming one's own tongue? And the answer is definitely yes. There is hope. We can strive to, to tame our tongue and to at least improve and continuously improve what comes out of our mouth. So in the remainder of this message, let's look at seven keys to restraining or taming one's tongue. We're here in James. Let's look at, again at James chapter 1, this time in verse 19. He says something here that is very wise, obviously inspired by God. He says, so then, my beloved brethren, this is verse 19 of James 1, let every man be what? Be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath. We are to be quick to listen. Make sure that we are spending enough time listening before we speak. And then he says to be slow to speak, to be careful. Or put another way, we should listen first and then think before you speak. So I mentioned that I have seven keys. The first five can be remembered by the, the acronym THINK, T-H-I-N-K. How many of you have heard about this before in terms of controlling your tongue? There's been some. There are people in, the, in psychology and in other areas in academia that have realized the power of this, this acronym. But I've looked at it in the light of God's word and God's word strongly supports the first five keys that can be represented by the word think or the acronym think. So let's begin. Let's look at key number one. In bridling your tongue is to always strive to speak only the truth. Now you may say, well, of course, 
is that really what's happening sometimes? Now let's look at Proverbs if you held your place with a marker. Back in Proverbs 25, verse 18. Solomon writes, a man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. You know, bearing false witness against someone is, is like using a club against them or a sword, as we've already seen, against your neighbor. In other words, you can hurt them and injure them. And that damage can be great at times. Here again, we see the tongue compared to a sword and how false information and outright lies and spinning something out of context can be very damaging and is sinful. So before we say something, do we think, is it true? Is it really true? Do we know it? And even if it is, we may not, should not say it, but we should always strive to only speak the truth. Here in, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 7. It says, The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, or spread knowledge, but the heart of the fool does not do so. So the lips of the wise spread knowledge of what is true and of value, but the heart of the fool and the mouth of the fool do not. And this, of course, applies in general. You know, the wise speak of, of what is true and appropriate, while the fool pours, pours forth foolishness. But also consider this application of the verse. When we hear something, brethren, particularly something bad about a person, for instance, and we pass it on, we are not dispersing knowledge. We don't really know if it's actually true or not. And we may likely be dispersing something that is not true, is out of context, or is incomplete. And passing it on doesn't serve any true value. It's not passing on knowledge, because it may not be true. And many times it isn't, or it's been spun or exaggerated. And this is at the core of gossip. We hear something and you spread it. You don't know if it's really true, or if it's fully true, or if there's nuances. And it may not be appropriate to spread it anyway, and we'll talk about that later. And so Solomon says that the wise avoid this. In other words, if you don't know if it's true, then don't say it. Don't spread it. In Proverbs 10, verse 18, just a few pages over, he talks about something that's even going beyond what we've been talking about so far, about spreading something that's wrong about someone else. Proverbs 10, verse 18, he says, Whoever hides hatred has lying lips, and whoever spreads slander is a fool. Oftentimes, we are motivated or can be tempted to spread bad things about a person we do not like, or at the extreme, actually hate, which we, which we should never do. We should never hate someone. But we may not like someone, so we hear something and it can be easy to kind of pass that on because, you know what, we don't really like this person anyway. Solomon says that this is wrong. We are not to do this. First of all, it may not be true and it may not be appropriate, but you should never be motivated to spread something because you want it to be spread because you don't like that person. That's what Solomon is saying. And brethren, we see this happen all the time in our society, in our world around us, and increasingly in various forms of our media, where things are said about people by others because they don't like those people. And then what happens? The media spreads it and it amplifies the damage. And it's intentional. And of course, this is very wrong. And sometimes there's even an evil element behind it when we see this happening in the world around us and in our media and what we hear. But we should never be motivated to say something about someone because we don't like them or we're angry with them. Don't say anything. And I know that's hard to do and we'll talk more about that later. 
First Peter chapter three. If you can hold your place here in Proverbs and turn with me to First Peter chapter three, we'll read verses ten through eleven. Peter writes, he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain or restrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Don't use your tongue for evil and sin. Prevent your lips from, from spreading deceit. Turn away from evil and do good, as Peter says. Make sure what you say is actually true, and you know it's true. If you do not know for sure, then don't say it at all. In this way, you will seek and pursue peace. Let's look at key number two, which is the H in think. So key number two to bridling your tongue is to strive to think if what you are going to say will be helpful or not. So we've seen, is, is it truthful? And now, is it helpful? If you can go back to Proverbs, this time Proverbs 12, verse 18. Proverbs 12, verse 18. There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. And again, this analogy to the sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. You know, the wrong use of the tongue, as we have seen, can bring stress and upset and damage. The wise use of the tongue promotes health because it promotes peace and good outcomes. So consider, is what you are about to say helpful or not? You're in a conversation and you're thinking, I'm going to say this. Is it going to be helpful or not? In Proverbs 15, verse 1 is one of, I think, one of the most profound verses in Solomon's writings. When he says that a soft answer turns away wrath, wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. How you answer can make a huge difference, especially when the person you're talking to is already getting angry or is getting upset. And they may be angering you. Do you return anger in kind? Because what that will do is stir it up even more. But a soft answer can really dismantle that and can cut off that anger in the other person. And guess what? It was helpful, wasn't it? It was helpful. In the next verse, in verse 2, it says, The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly or for good purposes. Before you say something, think about whether you are about to say will serve a good purpose or not. Consider whether God would consider it foolish or not when you are called to account for what you say from your mouth, is it really helpful? Or is it just going to stir things up more? It's better to not say anything than to say something that is going to make the situation worse. So let's look at key number three now, which will be the I in think. So key number three to bridling your tongue is to consider whether what you are going to say will be inspiring to others or not. Again in Proverbs, this time in Proverbs 18, verse 4. If you've been able to hold your place here, it's not too far away. It said, the words, it, Solomon writes, the words of a man's mouth are deep waters, but the wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. Our wise words are like a flowing brook a source of refreshment. Is what you're about to say going to be refreshing 
to someone or not. If you hold your place and turn over to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, the Apostle Paul talks about this as well. This is Ephesians 4, verse 29. He writes to the Ephesians, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. What is edification? It is building up others and encouraging others. And the opposite is tearing them down and discouraging them. Then he says that it may impart grace or a blessing to the hearers. So is what you're going to say going to be inspiring? Is it going to be encouraging? Is it going to be building somebody up? Or is it going to be tearing someone down? And once again, we see how gossip fails this so fantastically. Because gossip is always tearing somebody down, isn't it? Somebody somewhere. It's usually about something bad. And it's discouraging. You know, brethren, sometimes when we say something to others, to another person, there's negativity. And that negativity can have an effect on others as well who also hear it or who later hear it and spread it. And that negativity can then multiply. It's kind of amplified because, hey, did you hear or did you hear or they, other people heard you say it? And so not only is the person you're talking about going to be discouraged, but others may be discouraged too. And brethren, we've all sinned in this way. And we need to be aware of it and to repent of it and to grow. And that's how the tongue, brethren, this multiplying factor, especially with, it works both ways, but with negativity, that's how the tongue can cause such a great fire, as James says. But as I've kind of hinted, the opposite is also true. A wise and good word of encouragement can also affect many others and spread encouragement to many people. So as we saw, the tongue is a two-edged sword. Strive to always use the good side of the sword. That you, what you're saying is edifying or building others up and inspiring them and not being negative and tearing people down. Let me just read to you 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Paul writes, Therefore comfort each other and edify or build up each other just as you are doing. So brethren, before you speak, think about what, think if what you're going to say will build others up and not tear them down. And I include myself. We all struggle with this. Back in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. <clears throat> it says, Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. You know, a person may have anxiety in his heart. And then when you say something to them, are you going to build them up and inspire them and encourage them? Or are you going to discourage them further? But a good, a good word, and as we saw earlier, spoken at just the right time, can really encourage that person. Strive for that good word to come from you, to come from you. Key number four to bridling our tongue, this is N, is to consider if you're going to say, what you're going to say is really necessary or not. And this actually is a very interesting key. It's perhaps something we don't think about as much before we speak. Is what we are going to say really necessary to say? Proverbs 10, we're not far from where we just were in Proverbs 10, verse 19. Proverbs, uh, Solomon gives some very good advice. 
This is in Proverbs 10, verse 19. He says, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. Limit your words, because in much speaking, sin usually creeps in. Strive to say less, and it will limit sin from creeping into what you say. It's really easy sometimes to get on a roll, and we're really you know, talking and talking, and, and maybe we should be listening more, and we're talking a lot and talking a lot, and then we can say something that's wrong. And maybe we should limit a little bit more what we're saying because it opens the door for us to say something wrong. As Solomon says, it's better to limit what you say and not have so much speaking. In Proverbs 15, verse 28, he says something else that's very interesting. He says, the heart of the righteous studies or considers or thinks about how to answer but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. So think about what you're going to say and think about what effect it may have and think about is it really necessary to say it at all? Is it really necessary? Sometimes it's not. And it's better to say nothing. And then in Proverbs 29, verse 20. He says, do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Don't be hasty in what you say. And that's, that's a really easy trap to fall into. Somebody says something, thought pops into your mind, you start Hey, and you say something, and maybe you didn't think about it all the way through because you were hasty. Remember what James said, to think, to be slow to speak, and to listen. But when we're hasty, then we can fall into and trip over our own words and say something that we should not have said, that was not necessary to say. That's another wise advice from Solomon. Well, let's look in Proverbs 10 and look at verse 32, because there's another element of speaking that we'll address here very, we'll address it fairly briefly, but it definitely is part of the use of our tongue, the wrong use of our tongue, actually. This is Proverbs chapter 10, verse 32. <coughs> Excuse me, the lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked what is perverse. So consider if what you are about to say is acceptable to say. Let me say, well, what does that mean? Is it profane? Is it crude? Is it disrespectful? And cursing certainly falls into this category. So does taking the Lord's name in vain. That is so serious, brethren, that there's a commandment specifically against it. There was a very good sermonette given on June 12th by Mr. Clint Porter in Cincinnati, and I listened to that. Someone told me about it. And he talks about how God has put his name on us and his spirit in us. To use his name in vain is such an affront with what we are as his children to do that. It's a slap in his face, and it breaks the third commandment. And others that see us do it, what must they think if we're taking the Lord's name in vain? How abhorrent that truly is. And we must be careful with this, because we see it in the world all around us, and we can fall into it. And then there's what I call, and others call, soft swearing, of using other words that maybe aren't as harsh as the really harsh ones, but they sort of have the same meaning. Like using the word gosh, for instance, or geez. These words are used, for example, on one of our articles on our UCG website. Where to avoid these euphemisms, they're called, that are used as a type of swearing. 
and everybody knows what, what you're saying, but it's kind of a softer way of saying it, that also should not be coming from our mouths. It is not necessary, and it is disrespectful to God, in many cases, if we're using his name. And it's even not true. Who are we to condemn someone in God's name? Who are we to do that? That is God's prerogative. And for us to say it, that's not true. So it fails the T key, doesn't it? It's not necessary. It's not inspiring. It's not helpful. It fails all of them. And it's going to fail the next one, too, which we'll talk about. We are to be careful what comes from our mouth and even using soft euthanisms. And I include myself because it's easy to fall into that, isn't it? And if you do it, repent of it and realize it's serious and it needs to stop and take it to God. And we'll talk more about that later in the message. But for this key, let's go to a, keep your place here in Proverbs and let's look in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 in verse 7. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is a remarkable passage in God's word. It's been put to song, a beautiful song, and it is just full of wisdom. In verse 7, Solomon says that there is a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, or time to keep silence, and a time to speak. There's a time to speak and a time to keep silent. There's a time when it is not necessary to speak. We can grow in our personal practice of this word, of this verse, of knowing when is the right time to be silent and when is the right time to speak with God's help. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's look at the fifth key, which is the K in think. And it is to consider whether what you are about to say will be kind or not. Will it be kind? Let's go back to Proverbs. We'll go back to Proverbs 15, verse 1. And I know that we've already been there. But it actually is a very powerful verse. And it, it can be used in other of these points. But a soft answer turns away wrath but a harsh word turns up anger. That soft answer really can make a huge difference. It can be so powerful, and it also applies very powerfully with kindness. Even when someone is angry at you, and you give a soft answer, you are being kind to them, even if they're not being kind to you. And in Proverbs 16, 24, we've read that as well. But it talked about how pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. You know, when we use pleasant words, we're practicing kindness because there's joy that comes from that. In Ephesians, keep your place here if you have your marker, which I don't, here it is, Ephesians 4, Verse 32. If you'll turn there with me, please. Ephesians 4, verse 32. Paul writes to the Ephesians, he says, And be kind to one another, and tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. This is also a very powerful scripture telling us that we are to be kind to one another. And one of the ways that we can be kind is in what we say from our mouths. You know, kindness does not have a direct synonym. There is not another word that fully describes what kindness is. But in general, kindness means to, to have this attitude to, to serve and help others without expecting anything in return. And as I said, what com comes out of our mouths is a major way that we can be kind and we can practice true kindness and we can serve others. Even if they're hurting us, 
We don't have to return that in kind. We can give a soft answer, or we can say something that is uplifting and inspiring versus trying to tear them down. Maybe we need to forgive them to do that. Paul says it right here, to be tender-hearted and to forgive one another. So all of this kind of comes together, and it has a direct application to what we say and are we practicing kindness in what we say? You know, we read earlier in Proverbs 15, 28, that we are to study or to think about or to consider what we say before we say it. That was in Proverbs 15, verse 28. We need to consider if what we are about to say will hurt someone. Or will it be kind to that person? whether or not they deserve it or not, because kindness is serving that person and forgiving them even if they don't deserve it. Do our words, do we practice kindness in our words and do our words reflect kindness? So we've gone through the first five that can be represented by think. That is truth. Is what you are saying truthful or not? Do you really know? If you don't, don't say it. Is what you're about to say helpful? Or will it cause more anger and resentment and inflame the situation or, or cause more confusion? Or will it cast someone in a bad light? And it may be totally unfair because you don't even know if it's true. If it will not be helpful, don't say it. It's the H, the I, inspiring. Is what you're about to say uplifting? Is it building someone up or tearing them down? Does it promote encouragement or discouragement? If it's not inspiring, don't say it. The end for necessary. Is what you're about to say really necessary to say? Remember what Solomon says, there's a time to be silent. If it's not necessary, hold your tongue. Is it kind, the K, in think? Is what I'm about to say kind or not? Will it serve and help the person who is the subject of what I'm about to say? If not, don't say it. And these are great keys, brethren, to keep in mind to help us control our tongues. But something else is still needed. Two other keys are needed. This is key number six. Pray daily for wisdom. Did you notice in many of the scriptures that we read in the Proverbs, remember what Solomon was saying, that the wise do not do that. The wise are not hasty. The wise are dispensing true knowledge. The wise are controlling their tongue. It's incredible, isn't it? It's interesting because Solomon was given the gift of wisdom and he saw and understood this, this aspect of human behavior. The wisdom that he had received from God himself, who is the true source of wisdom. Because wisdom is a powerful tool to help us use those think keys that we just talked about, to actually apply them, to have the wisdom to know when to not say anything or to understand is something really inspiring or is it helpful? Is it kind? It is so important. And notice in James chapter 1 verse 5, you know, James wrote a lot about the tongue. We, we began the message with it. He talked about how the tongue is just an unruly evil and how it can set off a fire in a forest. But notice what he says in verse 5 of chapter 1. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? That God will give you wisdom. Do you believe it enough to pray for it every day? Because it will help you tremendously in your life, especially in what 
comes out of your mouth and how you can restrain your tongue. Pray for it every day. Ask God, please give me more of your wisdom. And God is the source of true wisdom, the only source. Do we pray for it every day? Because if we do, we can use those think, that, those think tools. And then the, the seventh, the last key that we'll talk about in controlling our tongue is to pray for more of God's spirit every day and yield yourself to the spirit. Now, a whole sermon could be given on this point. A whole sermon. No question. But why is this needed to control our tongues? God's Holy Spirit and us using that spirit and yielding to it. As we read earlier, God tells us that no man can tame his tongue in and of himself. But with the power of God within us, his Holy Spirit, we can strive to control our tongue. We won't turn there, but in Galatians 5, Galatians 5, the Apostle Paul lists the fruits of God's Holy Spirit. Working with human beings. And on that list is self-control. There's kindness on that list. There's gentleness on the list. There's long-suffering or patience. And how often do we need that when we're talking to someone sometimes? There's peace. And there's love. All of those fruits of God's Spirit can come about within us as we yield to God's Spirit within us. And they can help us to control our tongue tremendously help us to control our tongue. And God's Spirit will help us to change what is in our heart and in our minds to get rid of ill will toward others. Remember we talked about that and Solomon addressed it, that you can have ill will toward someone so it makes it kind of easy to say bad things about them. With God's power within you, you can get rid of that. You can get rid of resentment and envy, and bitterness, and ill will toward others. You can be changed from within by the power of God within you. And when we are changed from within, what comes out of our mouth is also changed. You know, we've read a lot of scriptures today, so this is the last scripture, and I'll read it to you. It's the words of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 6, verse 45. He says, quote, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his, of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks, unquote. This is so profound, isn't it? Because changing what is in our heart and character, the treasure that is within us, will change what comes out of our mouth. If we have more self-control, and we have more kindness and gentleness and peace and love and patience and these things that we've talked about, then we can greatly strive to control what comes out of our mouth and not say things that hurt people and damage people and set a giant blaze of flame. Because we will have been changed from the inside out. And that's what's going to happen to happen. That is what is going to have to happen to every person that will inherit eternal life. They, will, they must be changed from the inside out. Now is our time. Pray every day for more of God's spirit and to help, for God's help for you to yield to that spirit within you. For the will to do so. And allow God to change you, to transform you, as Paul says in Romans 12. Because, brethren, this will go a long way toward helping you to guard your tongue. And me as well. So I hope this message has been profitable for you today. I hope it has been inspiring as it was for me in preparing it. And I hope you remember and apply those seven keys to taming your tongue. To think and then to pray for wisdom and God's spirit and the will to yield to it.
With God's help, we can strive to control our tongues as God prepares us for his divine family. Enjoy the rest of the Sabbath day.